back with Robert Falcon Millet. I want to talk a little bit about the Tensei. Tensei. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, the government's record on indigenous advancement. Tell me about your background and how you feel the government has been doing. And so that is Cree, Nehio, and it says, I'm very proud to be here, all my relations. And, uh, you know, when I first uh, entered in Parliament, I actually started using, uh, you know, m my Indigenous language, the Nehio, or Cree language, as much as I possibly could. And, and, and where are you from? I'm from Red Pheasant Cree Nation in Saskatchewan, which is just outside of Battleford. Okay. Um, it's... Uh, South or northwestern Saskatchewan, right. over the center, right. and you know near Lloydminster, near Saskatoon. Um, beautiful area, rolling hills. It's along the North Saskatchewan River. You know, very beautiful country, uh, and uh, you know, just you know, just love the smell actually of the prairie. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. There's something about it. The prairie is actually the smell. Actually, if you when you're in the prairies, it actually goes all the way from uh, all the way from Alberta all the way out to uh, Manitoba. And you know, there's a it's a different feel. And how would even you on how would you skin. define it? Is it like the smell of the earth of the plants? It's I don't know how to describe it. It's just yeah, there is an earthy smell. It's a bit of maybe some maybe a bit of dust. It's a little drier. It's, uh, you know, the smell here in Ottawa or in, in Ontario and Quebec is a different feel on your skin. Um, but when you're when you're there, it just kind of in, 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 envelopes you, or in, in you're just you know you're just kind of it's very comfortable for me. So tell me about your your interaction <laughs> with the government on the indigenous issues that that it has addressed or needs to address. Uh, well, I one um, you know twenty one percent of my riding uh, is indigenous. A lot of First Nations are often very poor, ignored for a very long time, and um, and I what I wanted to do when I became an MP was also represent people who had often been ignored, and you know we had the largest contingent of uh, Indigenous MPs in, in Canadian history. Right. Uh, I, I was the chair of the Indigenous Caucus until 2019 uh, in Ottawa. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. We never actually had an Indigenous Caucus uh, before because there wasn't enough MPs. Uh, so uh, it was a very cool thing to participate in, to be able to sit around a table and discuss with, you know, people who were Métis, people who were Inuit, people who... Uh, Dene, um, uh, people from across Canada and all the different nations about what we should be doing and what we should advance and, and people's different viewpoints on issues and how we could work together to advance those causes uh, within the government in a positive way. And, you know, part of that is, you know, we actually did see an increase in funding for Indigenous peoples, $21 billion in new funds. Uh, we saw the ideas of reconciliation uh, move forward. Uh, but we also saw that the relationship is actually a very hard one to advance. And what I mean by that is that, you know, there is a long history of neglect, a long history of, you know, hate. And it's created, uh, you know, it's sometimes, you know, very important symbolic moments take on more importance than they should. And it becomes very uh, difficult uh, to control. And uh, even though you you know you spend more or get more funds than at any time in Canadian history for Indigenous peoples, uh, that's outweighed by the symbolism of these small, important events, which actually have no meaning in the larger, long-term uh, trajectory of what needs to happen for Indigenous peoples in this country. And uh, and and so. Uh, you know, I spent a, a lot of time, once again, as, as the chair of the Indigenous Caucus, when I get the microphone to advocate, one for education, uh, one for more spending on health care, Jordan's principle, trying to address some of these chronically under and, and or neglected issues. Uh, you know, Indigenous self-government, uh, which is extremely important, but also how we relate back and forth to each other. And, you know, also like, even, for instance, the murder and missing Indigenous women and girls inquiry, you know, the direction the government should take and how that we address it, how do we remain attentive to these, these things, um, 
to ensure that uh, people don't, you know, uh, don't feel that they're neglected. And an example of that is the murder of missing Indigenous women and girls inquiry. Uh, that is was fraught with the potential for lots of problems. Yeah, through symbolism. It's, through it, it's and time. if there are mistakes that would uh, mistakes, you know, there were mistakes that were being made in the beginning that were very difficult. But at the end, you know, when the government became more involved in listening to the final report, as an example, um, you know, counseled the prime minister, you know, you have to stay and not yeah. leave. You can't walk away. And the report was only supposed to be presented over for, as an example for, a, a, you know, a couple hours. You know, the prime minister actually stayed for literally four and a half hours at the history, Canadian History Museum of History in Gatineau. And he listened to the elders, he listened to the women, he listened and listened and listened and partook. He wasn't the center, but he was there. And he didn't say, oh, I've got a meeting that I need to get to and I've got to go, I'm very important. He stayed. And I think other prime ministers in past probably would have only stayed for the hour and a half and would have taken off. But, you know, uh, Mr. Trudeau, Justin, stayed there and you know I'm, I'm very proud of that moment because if he had left I think the symbolism uh, would have been uh, very yeah. onerous and very difficult and hard to repair yeah. and that relationship is already very difficult um, <laughs> where do you see that relationship going do you I mean it, it's a difficult one and I think both sides are working on it yeah um, on the one hand there's like endless patience <laughs> on behalf of the indigenous leaders is there? But, I think uh, I think there. Are, but but some are, are more impatient. I think them. a lot are very impatient. Um, uh, you know, I, I on one hand I see you know for instance the Métis leadership is extremely positive. David Chartrand from the Manitoba Métis Federation has been an important ally in trying to help the government. You know, telling uh, Métis people that this government has is one of the best. Uh, you know, to go out and vote, <laughs> to support the government, to lift them up. Uh, First Nations have been much more difficult. Uh, you know, whether it's right or wrong, and I understand, you know, there is a lot of anger. Yeah. Uh, but I think if you look at the history of Canada, it is an evolving uh, relationship. Um, I just like to say to my colleagues who are still in government, you, you know, even though you might not see, you know, the advantage to doing. Uh, reconciliation in such a strong way to keep going, to not stop, to keep pushing forward. So, so let me let, let me take you there. What's your recommendation to to your colleagues? To keep going, uh, because I think. Um, are, are there a few areas they need to focus on more? Well, I think they can continue focusing. One is you know getting the water boil advisories lifted in the next year and a half. Um, also, indigenous languages, child welfare reform and just continuing to do that work, ensuring that there's those investments into education. Uh, you know, we went from spending in education from six thousand and a six and a half thousand dollars a year in Manitoba uh, for First Nations education to eighteen thousand dollars a year. Per student. Per student. Yeah. Don't yeah. tell me that's nothing. Yeah. Like that is actual yeah. real dollars. Yeah. And you know, those dollars are gonna be helping with our youth group. You know, one of the things I like to talk about is, you know, as an adult I'm imperfect. I make a lot of mistakes. We all do. But if we can train our children properly they can do things more perfectly than we ever could. Yeah. And those, those children are the hope in the future. And, and that is the investment in our collective future as Canadians. And so, you know, those, that work is being done, but we can't lose faith. We need to keep going and keep doing that work. And so, you know, I'd encourage the government to do that. I know, uh, for instance, we have a new Minister of Indigenous Services, Mark Miller. You know, the one thing that impressed me with Mark is even though he's from Montreal, he's a Quebecer, uh, and you know we often have an, a preconceived notion of what Quebecers are, are like. You know, Mark has been learning the Mohawk language for two and a half years. He gave an enti he's given entire speeches in the House of Commons in the Mohawk language. Now I gave the very first entire speech in the Cree language, and in the, and an Indigenous language in the House of Commons. But Mark followed two weeks later with the Mohawk language, which he's been learning diligently, and he doesn't pretend to know things about indigenous peoples. But one, he listens, 
and two, he's willing to participate and contribute and, and, and to give the lead to Indigenous peoples. And when you, when you think about that, that's a huge change from past ministers who are, uh, you know, who wanted to be more critical, wanted to say, this is what you're going to do. This is what we're going to do. And he's been, uh, you know, in his efforts, he, uh, you know, takes his time. Just that one thing, it's so symbolic, but it's so important. And, you know, he was just, uh, during the election, actually, he took time out from the campaign to go to a conference uh, with the Mohawk people, at, and he spoke in Mohawk at the conference. You know, gave a little speech, a little bit in English, a little bit more in Mohawk. And is Mohawk's good enough that people Apparently understand Apparently people well understood enough? him. The <laughs> language keepers understood him. Oh, good, and, good. But he didn't pretend to be a language keeper. He didn't pretend that he knows everything. He just said, I'm here to just be respectful and to show that I am willing to learn. And so that I, you know, you have to respect that. So you're and, hopeful about that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like yeah. How, who, who takes an hour out of every day to learn an indigenous language in Canada, apart from indigenous peoples? Like it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. And that is now the new minister of indigenous services. That really bodes well, I think, uh, for this future relationship. Uh, because it's, it, 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 it speaks to his type of character and I think it speaks to the, you know, wh what he's been doing. And, you know, starting out as a backbench MP, working is, you know, just building that relationship. And I'll tell you one thing, he sees no electoral benefit from it. In his writing, right? In his writing. Yeah. He has very few Indigenous peoples in his writing. Because even the Mohawk people live outside of his writing, kind of Satake. Right. And on the other side of the river in Montreal, on the South Shore, and also uh, they don't even generally vote in Canadian elections. So they wouldn't even be able to vote for him if they could. Yet he continues to say, I'm on their traditional territory, I'm going to learn their language yeah, as best I cool. can. Cool. And so you think, the, is it a good partnership between Carol and Bennett and on Indigenous relations. Yeah, of course. And, Carolyn's pretty amazing. Uh, she's worked pretty... She knows this issue in and out. Um, you know, she also listens uh, quite readily. Uh, you know, she keeps moving forward. Uh, she travels a lot. She also has the, you know, advantage point of being, you know, even though she's from Toronto, she has the advantage point of being in a, uh, in a safer seat so she can concentrate on this. Uh, and give her entire effort to really working on the relationship. Now, there's two things actually that's going on in the government, and I'm you know happy to see this is happening. There is the uh, old Indigenous Services Department or Indian Affairs, as it was once, so uh, under the Indian Act. Right. And then there is the new Indigenous and Crown Relations Department, and this is beyond the Indian Act. This is Carolyn Bennett who's trying to move these relationships forward. And Mark Miller, the new Indigenous Services Minister, it's about ensuring that there are services offered and that you know, if people don't want to move beyond the Indian Act, that the services which are currently offered by the government are actual services, not a denial of services, but services which actually benefit people. Because when you and I go to a government agency, like Service Canada, you know, for our unemployment insurance or for, you know, our taxes, we want to be able to obtain good service. We want to be able to, uh, uh, yeah. you know, get, uh, you know, the things that, you know, we're entitled to as citizens. And Indigenous Peoples is the exact same thing. And so, you know, the, the word, the idea of service with Indigenous, in, in the new title of Indigenous Services is an extremely important one. And, uh, you know, happy that, you know, the Indigenous Caucus as a collective uh, participated in trying to get those changes, which are fundamental cultural changes happening in, in the mentality of the government. Because it, 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 it speaks to, you know, what people are doing. Because it, uh, if you, uh, people have to, can't underestimate how difficult culture is to change. I have a PhD in anthropology. And culture, uh, you know, collective culture undergirds how we interact with the world around us and with others. And if you have a culture which has been set up over a course of 150 years, a civil servant which has been doing something for 20 years that they learned from some another civil servant that did that for 35 years and it's been passed down, this is the way we do things 
why we do that is just how it is and you have to accept it and yeah we can make small changes but if we do f large fundamental changes it becomes you know it's hard to accept because you're telling someone we you know the way you were doing something is wrong and so in this case you know the government has taken a major shift in trying to get in Indian Affairs to become Indigenous Services and Indigenous Crown Relations. And that is extremely important. It is uh, uh, going to be... You know, I, always think, I always think about you're on a trajectory. You're, you're moving forward on a path. And all of a sudden you say, you know what, we're going to change. We're going to move two degrees in this direction. You know, in the beginning you don't see the change. But as you move forward, you know, that change, you know, after 10, 20 years is going to be important and different. Right, and if right. you can make that change 5%, 10%, all of a sudden, you know, you're talking, you know, in 10, 20 years, a 9% change. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're working, if you keep doing that change a little bit by little bit, you're going to be looking at a huge, massive revolution. It's a, that, and, the red and that, revolution, and that's the red revolution. And that's happening in government, <laughs> um, getting that out to the Canadian population in big cities and towns out there is still something we've got to deal with. Yeah, of course. Because the larger population isn't seeing the importance. Well, the, what yeah. we see is, um, you know, when you go to the library and you pick up a book, or you buy a book about Indigenous peoples, you hear about all the garbage that was done to indigenous peoples. Uh, we hear about the poor relationship that in Canada and indigenous peoples had. But we don't we don't think about the future. Right. We where we are the you're driving your car and the rear view mirror takes up almost the entire windshield as you're driving. And there's like a tiny crack about this little future. And we need to metaphor, shrink yeah. down yeah, that yeah. rearview mirror, and we need to focus on that future. Yeah. And that is kind of what's going on now, right now, is we're trying to make sure that we can actually focus and look around ourselves and to see beyond the rearview mirror, which is taking up far too much yeah. uh, um, vantage point among Canadians and Indigenous peoples. This is a fascinating chat, Robert. Um, <laughs> thank you for doing this. Yeah, yeah. But I also want to say, Thank you for your time as a member of Parliament. It's, I know it's arduous. We don't often recognize our members of Parliament, so thank you for the work you've done there. Oh, I appreciate but it. And thank you also. F I hope you're going to carry on this work, especially around uh, the advancement of Indigenous people, because the conversation you just had, I think, is, is an example of, of how you can relate some of these issues for the wider population. Yeah. Um, I hope you carry on that work. Oh, thanks very much. Good I really luck. appreciate it, Andrew, from the Pearson Center. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, you know, uh, you know, we actually do need Canadians to get more involved because it's extremely important. Yeah. And I'll leave you with one thing. I'll find a little antidote. Or uh, so, being an MP is extremely. I have to say, I've never worked harder. I was in the military for 23 years. And worked in full time, uh, you know, while the war in Afghanistan was going on, and I've never worked harder in my life. I'm kind of exhausted, happy to have a little break uh, to get some sleep, get the bags from under my eyes away, the wrinkles gone. And uh, one of the things I discovered uh, was you can get a lot of work if you sleep in your office. <laughs> so there was a period for about four months when I actually slept in my office uh, here in Ottawa. I, uh, I had an air mattress and I blow it up every night and put it away during the day. And uh, you know, you get up, you can work, sleep for about four hours. You know, go to bed at two o'clock in the morning, type on the computer, get up at six, back on that computer, sending out memos, emails to ministers, like, look at this issue. What about this issue? Because there's thirty. There were at that time thirty ministers. So every day you could do an issue for every minister, trying to get some movement for your writing and for, for Canadians. Not sure that's a very healthy lifestyle. It but, is not uh, a healthy lifestyle, well, but it's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Great. Thanks so much. <laughs>